Hey everyone, welcome to another session of Surrazzle Dazzle Physics. In today's session, we'll be talking about the following practical. The use of the falling ball method to determine the viscosity of a liquid, guys. So put down today's title, the use of the falling ball method to determine the viscosity of a liquid. And before we get going, guys, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button to keep my channel and content as free as possible for everyone to enjoy. Okay, so let's get straight into it. First of all, we'll talk about what actually is viscosity. So what is viscosity? Viscosity is the measure of how difficult it is for a liquid to flow. The more resistant a liquid is to flowing, the greater its viscosity, guys. And so imagine you had two liquids, guys. Imagine we gave you honey, we gave you water, and you tried to pour them. Which one would be more resistant to flow? Well, that would be the honey. So therefore, you would say that the honey has a greater viscosity compared to the water. So viscosity, guys, it's a measure of how difficult it is for a liquid to flow. And a good example will be that honey has a higher viscosity than water. Right, so we're going to do a practical today to work out the viscosity of a liquid. Uh, there's quite a lot of theory taking place here, so we're going to have to obviously break it down. We're going to do the theory first, and afterwards I'm going to outline the practical. So this is how we're going to construct it. Okay, so right, guys, we're going to start off with the following. We're going to get a measuring cylinder over here. Here's my measuring cylinder, okay? And the measuring cylinder, we're going to fill it up with the liquid. Okay, this is the liquid inside here. And our task is to find the viscosity of this liquid. So we're going to find the viscosity of this liquid. The symbol for viscosity is going to be lowercase n. So this stands for viscosity from now on, or eta if you want. Right, your task is to find the viscosity of this liquid. How we're going to do it is via the following method. We're going to drop ball bearings into the liquid over here and watch it as it falls down. Well, hopefully we remember that if we drop a ball bearing into the liquid, it will fall down, but eventually it will reach terminal velocity. If you have forgotten what terminal velocity means, it means the following. Let's say I have the following graph of, over here, velocity and time. Okay, and obviously as the ball bearing falls down, it will accelerate at the start and then eventually reach a constant speed. So the ball bearing will increase its velocity and then reach a constant value over here. And this is obviously the terminal velocity. Hopefully we can remember that from our previous studies over here. So let's say the ball has fallen down. So the ball is falling down and it reaches terminal velocity. So I'm just going to draw the ball over here. Here's the ball here. When it reaches terminal velocity, you know that the forces upon it will be balanced. Don't forget, this is going to be Newton's first law. As it's moving at a constant velocity, the forces therefore must be balanced upon the object. So we can put that down over here. So we know at this point here, the sum of the forces acting on it will be equal to zero. The total forces acting on it. So let's label those forces. So we know that as it falls down, the force that is bringing it down to the ground will be equal to the weight. So we're just going to put the weight going down over here. But also as the ball bearing goes down, yeah, and obviously this is all at terminal velocity, guys. So this is at, at terminal velocity, at terminal velocity. There we go, at terminal velocity over here. We know that there's a force pushing upwards. That's going to be due to the upfrost. So the upfrost is going to be pushing it upwards over here. So upfrost is acting on it. I'm just going to erase this to make sure no one gets confused. And also, guys, there's another force, which will be the drag force pushing upwards as well. So the drag force. Think about the liquid. The viscosity plays a part in how that ball bearing will move with it. And obviously, it will add some friction. So we're going to add the drag force, which is going to be pushing upwards here. Right, so from here, guys, we can derive an expression. We know that resultant force upon the object is zero. So therefore, you know that the upfrost acting upon the object, so U is the upfrost, plus the drag will be equal to the weight of the object, the weight of the object here. Now, from here, the drag force will be given by Stokes' law. So the drag force will be given by, I'm going to put it over here, uh, and this will be given to you, 6 pi r, the radius of the ball bearing, the viscosity times by the velocity it's moving at only at terminal velocity. So let's label that down here. So R is the radius of the ball. Uh, eta is the uh, viscosity. And then V is the velocity over here. Obviously, the velocity to terminal velocity. So velocity, I'm going to put open bracket the terminal here. 
Okay, so now we can replace our equation over here. So watch carefully. So we're going to put, I'm just going to move to this side over here. So up thrust plus the 6 pi r eta v will be equal to the weight of the ball bearing. Don't forget the forces are balanced over here. Right, we're going to replace the weight now. We also know that weight is the mass of the ball times by gravity, so we can replace that over here. So that would be the mass of the subscript ball times by gravity plus 6 pi r eta v. Okay. Now, the next thing I'm going to replace is the up thrust. Well, the up thrust, due to Archimedes' principle, will be equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. So the up thrust is equal to the weight of fluid displaced, which is therefore equal to the mass of the fluid times by gravity. Don't forget that, that's Archimedes' principle, the weight of the fluid displaced. So we can replace that over here, it'll be the mass of the fluid times by gravity. Actually, I'm going to remove the times here, I'm just going to put down times by gravity over here. There we go. Right, now, from here, uh, we're going to do the following, guys. I'm going to now replace the mass here. We know that the, with the density of the object. So we also know that density, we'll put it over here, density is equal to mass divided by volume. And we also know the volume is the volume of a sphere, so therefore it will be equal to 4 over 3 pi r cubed. So replacing all the mass of the fluid and the mass of the ball with the density and the volume over here, it therefore becomes um, the density of the fluid times by uh, 4 over 3 pi r cubed times by g plus 6 pi r e to v is equal to the density of the ball times by, uh, I'm just going to erase this on this side over here, just to make it easier for us. Um, density of the ball times by 4 over 3 pi r cubed g. Make sure we understand this formula, guys. Yeah, so look, there's a density times by the volume, which is the mass, times by gravity, same as before, and the density of the ball times by the volume of the ball times by gravity is the same as the expression beforehand. Okay, so from here, guys, I'm going to try and make v the subject of the formula. Therefore, it's going to be 6 pi r e to v will be equal to rho ball times by 4 over 3 pi r cubed g minus rho fluid times by 4 over 3 pi r cubed g over here. Then from here, guys, we're going to obviously factorise the, the common things out of the right-hand side. It therefore becomes 4 over 3 pi r cubed g, open bracket, the density of the ball minus the density of the fluid. And, and then from here, guys, we're going to keep the velocity over here, and therefore we divide it by 6 pi r times by the viscosity over here. There we go. Don't forget that, guys, we've got expression for the velocity, yes, the velocity here. You'll see it when I talk about the practical in a moment, yeah? So now from here, um, 4 over 3 divided by 6, that becomes 2 over 9, and pi and pi cancel out, and r cubed divided by r becomes r squared. So therefore, this expression therefore becomes 2 over 9 times by the viscosity times by r squared g, open bracket, density of the ball minus density of the fluid over here, close bracket over here. Then obviously we're just going to uh, bracket that over there. Wonderful. Okay, this is a very long method guys to be able to do this practical, but obviously look, we've just taken this, I've used Stokes law to be able to do this, we've looked at the weight, the up thrust and the drag, equated them, and then I've just done algebra to get it over here. So now, guys, we're at the stage which we have an expression of the velocity and the radius squared. So look, we can kind of guess now what the practical would be. We're going to change the radius of the ball, and we're going to measure the terminal velocity. So let's put that down. So look, this is today's practical. So we're going to be changing the radius of the ball, radius of ball, 
change the radius of the ball and measuring the velocity. Measuring the terminal velocity over here. Uh, right, and don't forget the density of the ball is a constant. Yes, so you can find the density of the ball. So density of the ball, we can work that out. So density of the ball, you can do either the mass of the ball divided by the volume. So you can measure the mass on a scale and divided by the volume of 4 over 3 pi r cubed. And the density of the fluid, guys, density of using the mass divided by the volume of it as well. So those two things are easier for us to calculate here. Or you can look them up online here. Okay, right, so the practical. What is the practical? So you're going to have the measuring cylinder over here. And then you're going to drop the ball bearing inside it. You're going to drop the ball bearing inside it. As the ball bearing travels through it, obviously what's going to happen is uh, it will reach the terminal velocity. So as it falls through it, maybe you can put a marker around the edges over here. There we go. And obviously the ball bearing, as it passes between these two points, it will obviously have reached its terminal velocity. So you can measure the distance over here and you can time it to work out the velocity. So you can time it to work out the velocity. Don't forget what you're changing, guys. We're going to be changing uh, the radius. But don't forget, obviously, you can't change the radius. You're changing the diameter. So the diameter is changing in each case here. So let's label the diameter over here. So there we go, D1, D2, and D3 here. So your table of results, diameter, obviously, uh, is your first one. And then to work at the radius of it, you just do D divided by 2. Radius is D divided by 2. And obviously, as you increase the diameter, you're going to be measuring the distance. You keep the distance between those two bands of the measuring cylinder. And then you have the time, the time taken for it to fall between these two. You can measure the time using a stopwatch, guys. And then finally, you can have the last column, which is the velocity, the velocity over here. Right, so it's a long practical, guys, but notice you're changing the radius of the ball and measuring the terminal velocity here by dropping it and looking at the distance, the time taken for it to travel this distance here. Right, now, what are we going to do with these results? I only really care about the, this column over here, the radius and the velocity, the velocity, which is the distance divided by the time. Don't forget, I measure that distance, I divide it by the time to get it over here. Right, now, from here, now we've got the velocity and we've got the radius over here. What graph are we going to plot? What graph are we going to plot to work out the viscosity? Don't forget, we're trying to work out the viscosity and we're gonna use a graphical method to do so. So now we've got this, uh, I'm gonna plot the following graph and you'll see the reason why. Okay, so as you can see guys, we're gonna plot the following graph, velocity versus the radius squared. Don't forget, I get my velocity values from here and the radius values here. So, oh, so I need a following column, guys. I need the radius squared. So this is another one, guys. Radius squared. So uh, I'm going to be using the radius squared over here. So the radius squared. So we get the values of R, and obviously we square it to get the radius squared. Why have I chosen the velocity versus the radius squared? Well, look, guys, we can look at the physics equation. So we know the physics equation is velocity is equal to 2 times by r squared g rho ball minus rho fluid divided by 9 times by the viscosity over here. Now, from here, we can see that if I plot this graph, it will actually give me a straight line relationship. Therefore, we will get a straight line relationship. Therefore, we will obey the equation of a straight line y is equal to mx plus c, okay, from here. Then, look, all I'm going to do now is I'm going to link the physics equation with the equation of a straight line, and we can see the reason why in a minute. So look, I'm just going to shift it. v is equal to 2g, open bracket, rho ball, minus rho fluid, close bracket, divided by 9n. And the R squared is now here. So I've just moved the R squared over. Now, why have I done this? Because now look, on the Y axis, if I've plotted V, and look, what I'm changing is R squared. So I'm just going to circle that over there. You can see that the gradient of this line will be equal to all of this. The gradient of this line is equal to all of this. So once you plot this graph, guys, you can see that the gradient of this line the gradient is equal to all of that. So we'll put it over here. So the gradient is equal to 
2 times by g, open bracket, the density of the ball minus the density of the fluid divided by 9 times by the viscosity over here. Therefore, to work out the viscosity, I can simply, of this liquid, the viscosity will be equal to 2 times by g, open bracket, density of the ball, minus the density of the fluid, divided by 9 times by your gradient. I'm going to put the square bracket for the gradient of that graph here. And that's how you can work out the viscosity of that liquid. Yes, via a graphical method, guys. So we have used the graphical method to do so. So this is the graphical method. Obviously, it's quite high tier. As you can see, it's very complicated to be able to understand this. But obviously, I've walked you through the entire thing over here. So that's how you can work at the viscosity by plotting the graph of the velocity versus the radius squared. And the gradient of that line will be equal to 2g density of the ball minus density of the fluid divided by 9 times by your viscosity. Then you rearrange it to find the viscosity. Easy stuff. Okay, let's have a quick recap right from the top. Okay, so today's title was to use the falling ball method to determine the viscosity of a liquid, and we did the following. We talked about viscosity itself, and it's the measure of how difficult it is for a liquid to flow. The more resistant a liquid is to flowing, the greater the viscosity. And then we talked about the following experiment. We said that if you dropped a ball bearing into the liquid, it will eventually reach terminal velocity. At terminal velocity, the resultant force is equal to zero. Therefore, the two forces pushing upwards will be equal to the weight pushing downwards. Yes, because it's moving at a constant velocity. The drag force is given by Stokes' law. That will be equal to 6 pi r e to v, where r is the radius, e to the viscosity, and v is the velocity over here. Okay, then we said up thrust plus the drag is equal to the weight. I changed the up thrust using Archimedes' principle because the up thrust upon the object is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. So it's the mass of the fluid times by gravity, the weight of the mass of the ball times by gravity. Then I replace the mass with the density times by the volume, and I times that by g. And then I replace the weight with the density of the ball times by the volume, and I times that by g as well. And then the next line, because I just tried to make v the subject of the formula, we end up with v is equal to 2 times by r squared, g, the density of the ball minus density of the fluid, divided by 9 times by the viscosity. Now it can indicate what we're going to do in the experiment. So we're going to change the radius of the ball and measure the, the terminal velocity here. Obviously, by changing the radius, you must change the diameter. Yes, yeah? so you can only change the diameter here. So we change the diameter, and we calculate the radius by doing the, the diameter divided by 2. We therefore measure the distance between two marks on the measuring cylinder and divide it by the time taken. We can measure that uh, using a stopwatch. We then plot the graph of velocity versus r squared. And then we linked the physics equation to the equation of the straight line, where velocity is equal to y, the r squared is the x-axis, therefore the gradient of the line is equal to 2g density of the ball minus density of the fluid divided by 9n. And following from that, we then know that the viscosity is equal to 2g density of the ball minus density of the fluid divided by 9 times by your gradient, guys. And that's how we did this problem. And that's it for another session of Sarazzle Dazzle Physics. I know it's very difficult and very challenging, guys, but make sure you watch it and make your own notes. Yeah, No point just watching me do it. You've got to do it yourself. Write it out. Make sure you understand the physics, the practical, relating the equation of the line to the physics equation, and how you're going to use your graph to determine the viscosity. And that's it, everyone. Ciao, ciao, and goodbye.